With large-scale war back in Europe, tensions building over Taiwan and the spectre of a return to great power confrontation across the globe, is it possible for any country to remain geopolitically neutral anymore? Welcome to the program. I'm Philip Hampshire. Countries like Austria, Ireland and Switzerland are clinging to their neutral status in Europe, even despite the war in Ukraine. Until recently, Finland and Sweden would have stood alongside them. But after Russia's attack on its neighbour, they both applied to join NATO. Helsinki has already become part of the alliance and Stockholm hopes to follow. They decided that neutrality, rather than keeping them safe from conflict, might actually leave them exposed to it. With China and the US and other world powers at odds, will everyone be forced to choose sides in this new era of uncertainty? Joining us today in Surrey in the UK, we have Professor Amelia Hadfield, who's head of the Department of Politics at the University of Surrey. Meanwhile, in Dublin, in Ireland, we have Jared Howlin, who's a former Republic of Ireland government advisor. And in Helsinki, we have Henry Van Hannen, who is a research fellow at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me. Amelia, I'm going to start off with you. Um, if we were talking about neutrality and we were looking back at historic conflicts, say something like World War II, in Europe, you had Spain that was neutral, but they sort of leaned one way towards the axis, but didn't really get involved in any of the fighting. We had Sweden that was neutral, again, leaned the other way, didn't get involved in any, any of the fighting. These days, it seems to be much more of a sliding scale. Switzerland, famously historically neutral, it's imposed sanctions on Russia. What is neutrality anymore for you? I would agree that it means many more complicated things now than it used to before. Probably the original traditional definition is just the conscious uh, decision to be non-aligned. So adopting a policy uh, whereby you, you place yourself emphatically in the middle of a political spectrum and you say, we believe what we believe, but we're not prepared to be allies or enemies to anybody else on either side of that spectrum. And that might have held, if you like, during the the, the biggest of the global, you know, uh, upheavals. World War II is a good example. Sweden and uh, Sweden and Spain and, and Switzerland. Now, however, I think the the option is for non-aligned to mean something rather more complicated. I think you can adopt uh, political uh, neutrality, uh, but still have a quite a robust uh, security proposition. Uh, you can have um, political non-neutrality uh, and and decide to be very very you know, neutral in terms of security and military. And then somewhere in the middle is the idea that you you're picking and choosing. Quite frankly, you have allies that you're prepared to back but only to a limited degree. So the neutrality is sort of self-imposed. It's a spectrum that you feel, I can choose this, but not this. And I think this gets us into some tricky waters. So maintaining neutrality becomes increasingly difficult. Um, and I'm sure later on in this conversation, we're going to talk a little bit about the way in which uh, European neutrals have gone basically from pieces on a chessboard to being rather less helpful and possibly a very real problem in terms of the geopolitical actor that is the European Union. Gerard, so for you, do you have any different views on what neutrality is or do you agree with all of that? Well, all of that is true because it's getting more complicated and the, chance, the opportunity for an easy answer to your question, I think, if it ever existed, is long past. And here in Ireland, here in Ireland, we're an island. Uh, and traditionally, that meant we were far away and the object of a lot of uh, disinterest. So it was very easy to be neutral. Uh, but the reality of our neutrality is much more complex. Uh, the Ukraine is just one part of that. But another part of it is that with modern communications, 65% uh, of all of Europe's cable uh, connections across the Atlantic go through Irish waters. Um, about 90% of all aviation across the uh, North Atlantic goes to Irish airspace. And we do not have the military capacity, uh, which is extremely limited, uh, to, to monitor activity in our own airspace and in our own water, for example, by Russian planes and ships who are very busy about us uh, in, on sea and in the air all, all the time. So what does that mean for our neutrality? And that's an open question here, which we as a country have not proposed any meaningful answer. Gerard, is 
is neutrality even meaningful for a country like Ireland at the moment? I mean, Austria is in a similar position as well. You've got the position of neutrality in the case of the Austrians actually enshrined into their laws. Um, and yet, because they're a member of the European Union, well, first of all, they've had to impose sanctions on various different countries around the world and individuals, most notably at the moment, of course, Russia and Russian individuals. But there's also the European Defence Forces, European Rapid Reaction Forces, European Common Security Commitments. Uh, is, is that even neutral anymore once you've reached that stage? Well, there's never been a pretense of neutrality in terms of world value systems. Ireland has certainly been very much part of the West of the democratic tradition for very much, for example, in, in the ambit of, of the United States economically. Joe Biden was here last week, received a very warm welcome, the eighth uh, president of the United States to visit an office since President Kennedy. Uh, so there is no neutrality culturally. Uh, or politically in that sense here in, in, in Ireland. There has been a military neutrality. We've been very active as a United Nations peacekeeper. But then, as you correctly say, there are uh, sort of EU commitments uh, which override that and do the undermine it to some extent. And that's a question that we fudge, frankly, rather than answer uh, very, 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 very frankly. Henry, uh, throughout the Cold War, Finland, very famous case of neutrality. You're up there in Helsinki right now. Finland trod a very careful balance throughout the Cold War between Russia and the West. And now it seems to have picked a side. Is neutrality gone fully for uh, Finland or uh, is it still deeply ingrained in the culture? Well, I think one must understand that Finnish neutrality is a good example of how neutrality is tied to geography, historical experiences, and just the prevailing circumstances. Finland opted for neutrality after the Second World War throughout the Cold War days. But this was a neutrality that was imposed upon Finland. It's not a neutrality that Finns would have chosen. The problem was that Finland had lost its wars with the Soviet Union. And this led to Finland trying to avoid becoming a complete satellite by opting for neutrality. So neutrality was a way to try to keep the Soviet influence at an arm's length. And I think an important note is that Finland formally abandoned neutrality already in the 90s when it joined the European Union. This was also stated quite clearly in the government white papers on foreign and security policy, saying that neutrality is no longer a viable policy. And instead, Finland became a militarily non-aligned country. And this is something that, of course, changed a couple of weeks ago when Finland decided to join NATO. And finally, the progress was, was done. But I think Finland's case is, is not it purely comparable to, for example, Ireland or Austria. It, it has a very own unique historic context. What about for Sweden? Because, of course, they're also in a similar position to Finland, but uh, not having been through that Cold War process known as Finlandization, where they had to be much more cautious with the Russians. Well, I think Sweden, on the other hand, is a very good example, too, since Sweden was if, if we speak of Swedish neutrality, it was more leaning to the West during the uh, NATO in the Cold War days. We know that Sweden had very close uh, discussions and potential defense plans with the Americans and also with NATO in the case if crisis would have come to Europe, uh, if, push would have, if push came to shove. And for Sweden, the luxury has been that it has not been bordering Russia, whereas Finland was bordering Russia and had to take that into account in its security calculus and its neutrality policy. So Finland was by default leading to the east and Sweden to the west. Gerard, if we look at the Irish case, we mentioned it, uh, you were mentioning a few moments ago, the sort of difficult fudge that Ireland is in at the moment. Is that, if you like, a specific policy to keep everything in a fudge situation? Or is there any desire among the populace there for some clarity caused by the war in Ukraine? Well, there's a desire for some clarity uh, by some parties in the parliament um, who I think would take a more Atlanticist uh, Western view of, of politics. Among the population of a whole, I would say there's a fairly deep attachment to what neutrality is without ever really explaining as adequately as to what it means. Uh, and don't ask me to explain that because it's inexplicable. Uh, so the chances of Ireland moving as, for example, Finland has, uh, or, or Sweden, uh, I 
don't see that happening or being a prospect anytime soon. I think much more realistically because of underinvestment in our own defence and because that's being badly exposed uh, by the activity of Russia in the air and in the sea around Ireland by a devastating attack on the computer systems of our health system last year, which disabled our, our health system for several days with all the consequences of that for patients, some of them in critical conditions. I think perhaps now for the first time, there's a willingness to ramp up defence spending to something nearing basic adequacy, uh, which simply has not existed here before. Does that not run risks of its own? I mean, obviously, Ireland has an extremely uh, friendly relationship at the moment with the United Kingdom. There's a very little uh, sort of friction between the two countries. Nonetheless, all of us are aware of the troubles that Ireland experienced during the 1960s through until the 1990s. The Good Friday Agreement at the moment, it's still relatively strong, but is a little bit shaky. If Ireland starts increasing its defence spending, is a vocal minority in Northern Ireland not going to get upset about that and cause problems? No, because perhaps I have failed to adequately explain the inadequacy of defence spending hitherto. Uh, we ca literally cannot uh, put sufficient ships on at the sea or launch uh, sufficient craft in the air to provide for basic scrutiny. Uh, so you're coming from a base that's so low uh, that any increased spending over the next couple of years is not going to bring us up uh, to a high, high level. And in relation to Northern Ireland, there are obviously a lot of tensions, uh, cross-community tensions there, all the time, not interestingly between Britain and Ireland, who are very much aligned, um, and that is a fruit, a positive outcome of the Good Friday Agreement. Amelia, let me take it on to you. Is there such a thing of, as neutrality anymore? I mean, if we, if we look at Switzerland, Switzerland famously has been neutral for several hundred years through its history. It's now a member of the United Nations. It's now putting in place these European Union sanctions. Just back in February, they had to debate. They have a panel in the country that debates, are we allowed to resell our arms that have been overseas and send them on to Ukraine? In that particular circumstance, they decided not to, but there's pressure there, isn't there? It's a real paradox, isn't it? The idea that you are neutral in the face of antagonism because it will extract you from the material aggressor, from the threat that that you're 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 facing, and yet at the same time, perhaps if there's if there's no threat and you're in a peaceful situation, you know you don't necessarily need to take sides. You can continue on. Neutrality is a uh, political, uh, cultural, perhaps even national identity, constitutional even uh, based method of defining your your state, your your nation state, and, and the way you want to work your your governance in the in the 21st century. So you know neutrality, on paper, you know makes sense both in the face of war and, and then, you know, in the teeth of peace. Now, however, not only, I think, has uh, Jared, he's outlined really interestingly the multidimensional nature of what 21st century neutrality is, but I think Henry's given some nice case study examples as well of the very case-specific. So, again, not only is neutrality dependent on war and or peace, it's also a generic catch-all definition that can mean many things to many people. And it's also incredibly um, uh, case-specific, dependent in entirely upon the, the nature and the time and the location and the geopolitical context in which a, a given country finds itself. My sense is that it's kind of running out of road. The ability now, at least for, for European countries, to maintain neutrality is going to become in increasingly difficult. Um, it's very difficult, I think, now in, in the face of Russian aggression in the Ukraine to say, I'm not prepared to do anything. Um, and the vast majority of countries um, have either made big leaps like Sweden and Finland, um, or have at least got on the sanctions bus and said, we're not prepared to be a conduit monetarily or financially or from a banking perspective, you know, in, in aiding the, the the cause of war in Russia through, through Ukraine. Um, so that's, I think that's been a real sea change as well. Um, and I, I also mentioned before the idea that, you know, for the for the European Union, which is this sort of overarching, you know, uh, you sort of entity, if you like, that has a, a political identity, a monetary identity, and a security and defense identity, um, having sort of, you know, chunks of neutrality within it makes it really difficult. I mean, there's a deep desire to, to respect the constitutional political outlooks. Uh, within each of the European member states, and you know Austria for years and years was a big part of that, and so was you know uh, Finland. Um, 
but I think that, you know, time has moved on for all of the European Union member states. Denmark is a really interesting example because for years it, it, it held out in many ways against uh, being pulled in, if you like, to the common security and defense policy, the CSDP of the European Union. But but now, um, I think, has begun to see that logic uh, erode. So milita at the military level, from the perspective of the European Union, uh, the demands of 21st century warfare, um, that's increasingly putting pressure on, on countries who are attempting to fly a flag of neutrality, but are really, in practice, required to be highly integrated, very much more sophisticated, me, interoperable. Let me take um, this across to let me take this across to Henry. Henry, I can see you nodding there, um, so I'm going to throw you a, a very slight curve here. Uh, we've just had we were hearing uh, from Amelia about the European Union and its position in the world. Um, President Emmanuel Macron of France went across to China, representing the European Union. When he came back, he made statements to the effect of, "Look, Europe needs to find its own way as a sort of third superpower in the world." We need to decide for ourselves, do we want to get involved if tensions between the United States and China ramp up over the situation in Taiwan? You know, if you're a Scandinavian, do you really want to get involved in conflicts over on the other side of the world involving an island that probably really doesn't have very much to do with life in Finland? Well, I disagree. I think it has a lot to do with Finland, and I think it has a lot to do with the EU and, and its member states as well. I think this war in Ukraine is a great example of how wars are not local, unlike some presidential candidates in the US say that this is some kind of a border quarrel. This is definitely not the case. We see how it affects grain imports, fertilizers, economies, the price of energy. Uh, for example, in the case of Taiwan, it's one of the biggest uh, chip producers in the world, which means that if there would be a halt in that business that would have massive uh, ramifications for European countries as well. And I think it's an interesting thing that we have seen, for example, the, the, these so-called seismic impacts of, of Russia's invasion in their, and, and the reassessment of geopolitical alliances in many countries' security postures. I think we see the far-reaching effects in, in Finland, Sweden, Austria, Ireland, Switzerland. But we must not forget the UN also. I think it has indicated quite clearly that there's a division of, of uh, sort of in, in international affairs, how they perceive these, these wars. And some opt to remain neutral, as in not taking a stand on this issue, uh, on the war itself, not condemning Russia, not, not halting trade with Russia, but instead reinforcing it. So I think the, 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 the phenomenon that do we have neutrality or not, I think, We've never had a pure neutrality in the in the sort of theoretical sense, but I think we are seeing that it's as 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 the push can, comes to shove, we see that every country is trying to uh, sort of strengthen their alliances, and there's not that much room left to be in between anymore. Gerard, um, I'm going to uh, come back and focus on the Irish situation for a second. I've got a clip here from uh, the Thomas Byrne, who's the Irish Minister for European Affairs. Here's what he has to say. I think in Ireland we probably need a new conception of what defence is, a new concept, um, because I think for lots of our history and as, a, as an independent country, we, we, we were overshadowed or in our minds always was the British attempt at conscription uh, in 1918 in Ireland. And that, was part of a series of events that, that and, and that was a particularly important chain of that uh, series of events that led to our independence. I think we're, uh, partly where Irish neutrality comes from. Our neutrality has been characterised really by non-membership of military alliances, by getting involved in really important issues at the UN, such as nuclear non-proliferation. Ireland was a leading voice in that over many decades, and it still is. If Ireland is slowly taking, if you like, it, its first sort of baby steps, its first toddler steps towards moving away from a non-neutral position, and it comes straight into a world where the United States is running into tensions with China over Taiwan, uh, is it not going to suddenly crawl straight back into its shell and go, oh, this isn't what we signed on for? We were here for Ukraine, that's what we were coming out of our shells for, but now we're getting dragged into something completely different. Well, I think... 
the uh, situation in Taiwan would be completely different in this one respect of, of distance. Uh, with Ukraine, we've taken in a, a very large number of Ukrainians who are very much part of the cultural, diplomatic, political, economic uh, effort uh, on their behalf. There's no uh, neutrality or, or, or um, uh, and anything else about that. But I think in relation to Taiwan, although the issues are seismic, and the regime, the Chinese regime, the Russian regime, are, have values that are completely repellent to the Irish people. Uh, what practically uh, Ireland, a small country like Ireland, which the others could do in that situation, uh, remains to be seen. I think in our own thought world, in our mind, we wouldn't be remotely neutral. I think we would see China very much as an aggressor, as Taiwan, which unlike South Vietnam, clearly has the support of, of the people. It is a people-based, democratic, vibrant country uh, where the, the, the government is, is not a, a regime of, of dubious repute. It's a fully elected democratic government. And in that situation were something to happen, as Henry said, it would affect all the world profoundly. Because if Putin marches into Ukraine, if China marches into Taiwan, the world afterwards is profoundly changed, which is not to answer your question, but to say it is an open question that we have not thought through and which I cannot offer you an easy or pat answer today. Why is the debate on this subject, though, not happening yet in Ireland? Not, it's not being openly discussed in the Irish papers. It's not being talked about in pubs there yet. No, it's not. But, uh, Ukraine is being talked about an awful lot. Uh, and Taiwan does get a, a, fair bit, a fair bit of coverage in the Irish media. And people are very aware of the situation in Taiwan, uh, of the possibility of China invading. People are aware, too, of what happened to Hong Kong, the roll on of, of, of Chinese effectively overlordship of what was to be a separate system for, for many years to come. But in relation to Ukraine, I think it prompted quite a swift move on in the public mood and in culture. Um, and at the fact of so many Ukrainian people being here, living amongst us, Ukrainian flags are flying all over Ireland. Uh, it's little sports teams in small little places are involving uh, Ukrainian children. They're integrating them to the local schools. It's, it's a huge communal presence in our daily life. Literally all of a sudden, uh, it, it, it is only 13 or 14 months ago since these people started to arrive here. Now there's 70,000 plus in a small country and they are still coming. Uh, and that is changing culture and thinking here. Amelia, um, we've talked about Europe and the situation within the European Union, um, but there are vast swathes of the world, most of Africa, most of South America, uh, the Indian subcontinent, all of whom seem to be keeping very, very quiet, apart from uh, a handful of leaders. I've got a clip here from the Brazilian President Lula da Silva. It is necessary that the US stops stimulating the war and talks about peace. It's necessary that the European Union talks about peace so we can convince Putin and Zelensky that peace interests everybody and war only interests them both. Now, Amelia, on the face of it, language like that would appear to be a flavour of political neutrality. But, of course, the European Union, the Ukraine, Canada, the United States would all look at that and say, well, hang on a second, if you want peace now, after Russia invaded and it's already occupied a percentage of the country, that's not neutrality at all. And there is this slightly uncomfortable... Uh, vein running through uh, Indian foreign policy, South African foreign policy, Brazilian foreign policy, lots of countries that appear to be neutral and sitting on the sidelines. What do you make of that? I don't find that statement remotely neutral, actually. I think, uh, you know, uh, Lula knows exactly what he's doing. He has to walk a very fine line, almost a bipolar line, if you like, between the requirements of being one of the BRIC countries, um, which uh, tend to be the sort of <laughs> the antagonists, if you like, of uh, the majority of the, uh, the, the the global international system, if I can euphemistically call it that. Um, and that also being you know, pretty clear in his charge against Russia in terms of the illegal invasion of Ukraine um, and saying we want peace, war is terrible, etc. So he's, I think, peppering some fairly generic observations with with a couple of things. One, suggesting perhaps that, you know, it's time for the BRICs to make up their, their mind 
being very aware that um, you know, India, as you as you quite correctly have said, has you know, have played their cards very close to their chest. Interesting, because of course in the 50s and 60s India was famously uh, non-aligned, um, and there was pushing and pulling throughout the Cold War to try to get it to chippy one way or the other. Um, and of course China, which even now the jury is out on in in, in many ways, because uh, I think we we look to China and possibly to some extent Brazil uh, to be an interlocutor and possibly to be able to change um, or to. Um, um, alter or even augment Putin's thinking. Um, and I think that, you know, the hope is that, you know, that's that's fine. Those are ideologies that they can pursue and perhaps we can, you know, change the white noise on that. But as long as they don't actively and continuously arm Russia, that's that's fine. The problem is, I think, with that statement that, that uh, you, you played, Philip, is, of course, that it, it just shows once again that neutrality is very much a bit of a pick and mix. I'm happy to take, you know, political neutrality, but not military one. I'm happy to back a sanction, uh, but I'm not necessarily happy to to make any changes um, in, in terms of the composition of my state. And I think we, again, I, I, I think that's, we're running out of road in terms of the practicality of that. The war in Ukraine is, is so profound. It's so global and so very consequential, as, as, as both our speakers have, have um, explained, that neutrality is no longer good enough. It's not a rampart. It's not a barrier that's going to be able to prevent you um, from engaging now. And it's certainly not going to ring fence you against the impacts of the future. Well, thank you very much, all three of you, for coming in and joining me today. I'm afraid that that's all we have time for for this show. However, if you want to see more discussion and debate, head on over to our YouTube channel and search for Roundtable TRT World. For now, from me here and all of the team, thank you for watching and goodbye.